Friday. Yeah, I know. I don't know if it feels like a Friday, but... <laughs> is, is that a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> uh, you know, we're, we're always working, so... <laughs> That's great. It's awesome. Yeah. No, it's awesome. Thanks so much um, for joining me. I'm so happy we actually could just sit down and talk. Yeah, this is going to be awesome. I'm really looking forward to this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we can jump right in. I know um, it says there's 25 people and counting, um, but kind of just walking through, you know, what it's been like to be an entrepreneur, um, both of us being entrepreneurs for quite a while, both of us having companies behind us. Um, we can kind of get started with like your entrepreneurship journey and kind of how it led to sport trade. Yeah, I mean, I, I just kind of started at a super high level. I think, mm -hmm. you know, obviously I was at Drexel which is right across the river here. We're in Camden, New Jersey, oh, yes. our HQ, which is oh, super sure. funny, nice day. Uh, it's always nice to see the ships passing by in the Delaware. Uh, yeah, it's always nice to see the sun in Philly. <laughs> yes, the sun in Philly, it is sunny in Philadelphia. That's just in. Uh, it has been actually really sunny the last few months. It hasn't been too yeah. warm. The weather has been amazing. I'm, I'm sure not as nice as, as the West Coast, but you know. Yeah, I just got to California and I have nothing to complain about out here with the weather. <laughs> Yeah, but what, what was the weather today? Like 78 and sunny, no humidity? I think so, just about. I think this weekend's supposed to be really nice too. So coming from uh, New York City, I, I really can't complain. <laughs> yeah, there's no no complaints there. Um, so I graduated Drexel in 2017. And at Drexel, I got introduced to sports betting. I got introduced to financial trading. I got introduced mm -hmm. to how capital markets kind of used to work 20 years ago. And I just remember, I never forget the moment when someone like showed me what looked like an Excel document, but apparently was a website of a sports betting website. And mm -hmm. I thought to myself like, oh, I just don't understand this. Like I, I wasn't a sports better. I had never tried it before. It was illegal at the time. I just felt like the FBI was gonna come in and knock down the doors <laughs> the second I tried to like give someone $5. Mm -hmm. And you know, I had also been introduced to Robinhood and I just thought, man, this has gotta exist. And I remember thinking like typing in on Google like Robinhood for sports or Coinbase over sports or trading app sports. And when I didn't find anything, I was like, wow, maybe I can create something. And, you know, that journey has been about a four, four and a half year journey at this point. Mm -hmm. And every so often I still pinch myself that like at some point I was just sitting in like an options trading course thinking, man, yeah. I'm going to try to start this company. And do I have what it takes to do this? And I think mm -hmm. all entrepreneurs deal with that, that doubt yeah. because like, you know, there's no special skill set that you're endowed with to be an entrepreneur. You just kind of mm -hmm. have to do it and you end up surprising yourself along the way. So that's yeah. a little bit about my story. Okay. And yeah, I mean, I think like that doubt that you're talking about, like imposter syndrome, I think it's something that people don't really talk about as much. I think, you know, a lot of creators, um, even like on the influencer side, because that's where my background is too, they are always like feeling like, why, like, how can I monetize my platform? Like, how did I suddenly get to like 100,000 followers? And like, in your case, like, am I the right person to start a company that's literally going to revolutionize the industry? Um, I guess, like, have you felt the imposter syndrome yet? Like, have you felt the doubt as of recent? Or has that kind of like flown away as you've grown? Uh, it's definitely flown away. I mean, I definitely still remember the times where I'm creating what it could look like using literally yeah. Google Sheets. <laughs> and thank gosh, we have just so many. I probably am now at this point the least creative person in the firm. But from a design perspective, like what I've, that as that's transitioned away, what's kind of taken its place is the degree to which I've been so blown away that mm -hmm. so many people have come in, adopted the vision, and are seeing that vision become a reality through the lens of their expertise. So it's been yeah. so cool to sit down and watch someone have a conversation in the office and be like, oh, I haven't even thought about this edge case. And they're so on top mm -hmm. of it. And mm -hmm. I think that's been like one of the coolest things for me. I would love to know, like from your perspective, like how, how you feel about, because that's something every entrepreneur deals with is the imposter syndrome. Yeah. I think, you know, from my perspective, I, uh, <laughs> my most recent like full-time job was um, left in 2021 for the New York Mets. And I think, my journey has been uh, long but short you know like i graduated pretty much around the same time and i went into the corporate world immediately and then really realized 
I wanted to get into um, sports and media and like influencer media. And from there, it kind of just like steamrolled. I've been like, I feel like I'm going like a mile a minute. Uh, so I think there's like moments, but for me, um, like everything's just moving so fast that I don't have a lot of time to think about it. And I think that like, to your point, um, I'm surrounded by like really amazing staff who are really creative, who just do a great job. And we're always like motivating and joking around with each other. So I think that's yeah. definitely kind of like taken a lot of the pressure off of it too. Yeah, that's super interesting. And one thing, you know, you're in a lot of ways so far ahead of where I, I am in my journey or we are in our journey because you've hit that aha moment. You've hit like the whoa, you know, we were both college athletes at some point. Actually, I don't know if I'd call myself a college athlete. Golf, I don't know, counts as a sport. No, that definitely was. I mean, I was a coxswain and like full transparency, the coxswain in rowing, like we sit in the boat and like we like steer, like I've got this really nice um, like banner behind me that I was a student athlete, mm -hmm. but like I steered a boat. Like I just, I steered the boat. So. <laughs> I tried to steer a golf ball. It didn't work at all. Uh, it, it tended to veer off like a banana one way or the other. Um, but I think what's so cool is like, you know, what, what was it like for that first time where you experienced the, oh my gosh, validation, like audience growth, hyper growth, like what, what did that like feel like? Because I've never felt that. Oh, wow. I think, you know, for us, like our agency and like the influencer and like NIL space in general, it's really about the athlete. It's about the creator. So I think an aha moment was, you know, we had our first content house and we had 11 creators living at the house for a full week sponsored by a brand and being able to have the brand come in and interact with the creator is something they've never really done before. And then having the creators being paid for their content, being paid for their likeness and like really being um, like accepted by the brand. I think it was such an amazing thing to see. And even today, like seeing creators being paid for their videos, I think that is like my aha moment that like we really do have a place in the creator economy, like democratizing and making sure the creators are being paid. I think like I see it every day. Yeah. And did you did that come to you as a, as a student athlete to realize that, wow, we, we really do have a big audience? or I have the ability to create an audience and that can be monetized. Like how did you, how did this idea come to be? Yeah, actually, yeah, it was in college. I uh, actually started out pre-med biomedical engineering, um, did about like two wow. years of that, <laughs> did about two years of that. Um, obviously I was a student athlete, so the timing just like didn't work out, but it was even during that time, you know, that student athletes, our pictures are everywhere. We're on the tickets, we're on like the banners, we're everywhere, but we do get a scholarship and some don't, but then, you know, we're still paying for food and we have to eat extra food. We have to train, we have study hall. Like we have so many little things that we're not really compensated for. And I think that's when I realized the gap between what the university made and like what they get in general and the student athletes was huge. Um, so just kind of took that with me. And that's when I decided to one day make a company about it. And then, you know, it makes sense. Influencers are the expert, like in the marketing space. So started with the influencers first and now the NIL passed. So now we switched over to athletes too. Yeah, that was huge. When, when we did the NIL pass, was that like last summer? Yeah, that was July. Um, so, and like now I'm in California because, you know, sports is huge out here. Um, the NIL is in high school. So it's been really great. And I mean, like even to that point, um, I guess like my re most rewarding point of building my startup was really the creators and the athletes, but in like a sport trade sense, like what was your most rewarding part? I think a lot of things. Like we, we were able to, to go to the NASDAQ market site. I think a couple of times there was the yeah. moment where like, it was on the big TV that like everyone mm -hmm. to be on. and all my friends and family from home are like, you IPO'd. <laughs> like, that's what they thought because they, you, 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 NASDAQ has this brand and it's like, well, yeah. you that you must have, you must have mm -hmm. IPO'd. Yeah. That was really cool. I think, I think honestly, it happens in very small pieces mm -hmm. right now because we are pre-launch, but being able to sit in or watch what happens when we introduce this product to a, to a tester, to a new mm -hmm. customer, and you, you get to that magic moment of like, wow, this is like Robin Hood. Like you got a portfolio and I have the Eagles here and I have the Bengals, yeah. and I have the over and, 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 and I can trade this. And like, that's like, yes, that is what we're creating. And if customers can perceive it to be that way, that's like really magical. So we're yeah. just at the point now where, you know, we're doing some more internal testing. We're sharing the app with everyone at the company. Mm -hmm. Greg just told me he's up $1,800 fake money. And that's how we knew, <laughs> that's how we knew it had to have been fake. That's his words, not mine. Um, so all of that's been cool. And then using it for the first time has been like, yeah, I think you get to this point where you pitch a business so much and you pitch and pitch and pitch and pitch. And then 
you try and you're like, oh my gosh, everything I've been saying is so legitimate. Like it, it, it exceeds yeah. what I've been pitching. Like, and for us, it's the in-play trading aspect. It's like right. the ability it's to huge. trade in and out. And that's what's so cool. Yeah. Oh, 100%. I mean, even with, you know, the ability to trade and just use the app, like during game and play, like you're saying, I think it's huge. And I mean, even to that point, like, what are you most excited about uh, with like the app and just like the launch? I think what I'm most excited about is there's a really interesting network effect that can happen mm -hmm. when, when, when you have the ability as a trader to take either mm -hmm. side of something. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna buy my more Apple shares. I'm gonna sell my Apple shares. Um, I think Fubo's earnings are gonna be bad versus good. I think Twitter, you know, is gonna get bought by Elon Musk or not. Um, I think <laughs> that the next meme stock is gonna be, you know, X versus Y. Yes. And I think bringing that to sports creates excitement around price discovery. And right. like, think about the NBA playoffs as a perfect example. Like the moment the Sixers beat. Uh, the Toronto Raptors last night. Mm -hmm. Now they're slated to play the Miami Heat. Right. And there's immediately an interest of, you know, mm -hmm. what's the Sixers price? Is it $42, implying 42% to win the series? Is it 48? Is it 50? What's the price for them to win the first game? Right. Um, and I think that being able to, to have all of that uh, chatter be kind of closing loop with a transactional component of like, mm -hmm. you can put your money where your mouth is, is going to take up a lot of virality. And I think right. it could even pick up virality with like sports reporters to say, well, mm -hmm. sports trade is the first true market. And the sports trade says that the Sixers now have a 16% chance to right. win the NBA championship. Why? Because they're trading $16 per contract, mm -hmm. just like you see in the stock market. Like that, that stock market is always referenced in articles right. and in pieces. Mm -hmm. I think inserting sports trade is the center of the conversation. Just the thought that that could actually happen is really yeah. cool. And it like it seems so much bigger, but it's so realistic too, because I mean, you see like people in another industry, it works for them and like they're the standard, but same thing now, like flipping over a sports trade, like this could be the standard. This could really be the thing to your point that reporters that um, TV, like this is what they're talking about. And this is what you're using as a standard of, oh, like this is the price um, and things like that. I think that's in itself, like amazing. When we talk about like goals and, things that like you didn't expect um being able to have that like north star in that big moment i think that'll be the next one yeah that that's certainly the vision and i, I can definitely even see a day where that you have mm -hmm. like a cnbc style show yeah where you know the, the center of the universe is the price mm -hmm. and everything everything is a basis for that price so why, why are the sixers up 10 percent today like there was a right. time of sitting here at the office in this exact spot like three four days ago and i got a notification from nba jimmy butler's out I thought to myself, okay, Jimmy Butler, he plays for the Heat. The Heat are playing the Hawks tonight. Oh, I bought the Hawks this morning on the Sports Trade app at 25, and I rushed into the app, and they were trading 37, and I sold it. And I thought, like, wow, that is, like, even pregame. Forget all the, you know, yeah. all the hyper dynamicism for in-play. Like, this mm -hmm. is before the game even starts. And being able to have Sports Trade be the, the epicenter of the conversation. Because yeah. even when I went to go sell at 37, it was jumping around. It was, like, 36, 38, 39, yeah. 37. And it was, and then I immediately rushed out to someone on our design team, and now he's opening the app. Now he's <laughs> trading, and you have this kind of really cool network effect mm -hmm. that that can happen. So that that's certainly the vision um, for us. I would love to know, like for you, like given where you are, and obviously having a ton of traction, um, <laughs> like what is that next like goal? What is that big milestone? Yeah. I think, you know, on the influencer side, um, we have like really, really more like long term goals um, on the athlete side, you know, NIL is a huge topic and NIL is something that we're trying to move forward with um, in representing athletes, even out in California, you know, high school athletes can be represented now can do NIL deals. So we're moving in on that side. And then um, we have our NIL course, which helps athletes actually go from like knowing nothing about this space to like signing brand deals to protecting themselves legally, financially, um, that course, we're getting it into universities out here. And then our goal is getting into the HBCUs with it, you know, like a group that really doesn't necessarily have the resources, or maybe even like the immediate attention that they need to be able to be successful in this space but creator wise it's a really really lofty goal um but we want to democratize the space like we want to give people and creators the ability to make content be paid whether it comes in the form of like having like a real salary having benefits like a real job um or even like working with the brands on a different level i think that that's really our goal is to help creators make this like a real job that they can sustain themselves with um, so it's a lofty goal, but it's definitely something we're like working towards every day. 
Yeah, that's really awesome. Um, I just feel like you're the type of person that's going to achieve the goal, which is awesome. Um, it, you know, the, the NIL, NIL thing is interesting because now mm-hmm. colleges, like even yesterday, there was a piece of news that came out that mm-hmm. basically the NCAA is now allowing colleges to monetize the sale of the game state data, which is precious to like companies like Sportrade that require that data so that our market makers can right. prices. Mm-hmm. And I think that, you know, NBA and NFL are kind of leading the way on this, but now the players are saying, well, hey, if, if, if the leagues right. and the owners and the teams are starting to monetize sports gambling, you know, how, how do we as the players you right. do that? I think, do you think that that trend continues down to college mm-hmm. where you could have like the, you know, University of Colorado Boulder, for example, or University of Maryland or Maryland are two schools that sign sports betting deals Mm-hmm. Um, I think LSU was another one that did, okay. that did the same with Caesars. Mm-hmm. Like, do you, do you see now now using name, image, likeness with gambling companies or sports betting companies? Do you see, see that like happening? Because I know the NCAA has been cleared that like, it does not allow. Yeah, that, but do you like think that's, that changes over the next five. Yeah, years? it's interesting, you know. Like, they, <laughs> and they were so strict on like we're never gonna like you know ruin amateurism. Um, but here we are in a you know market where athletes were really just commodities you know they're being traded to other teams like literally there's a price on like what our name image and likeness is so i think with that in mind it could change i think that it's interesting too that that is like the one major school that we have in the ncaa is like absolutely like no sports gambling nothing i think it would probably take a while for that to change um but it may potentially be on the table for them i think that really um when the fans when the players when the media like gets behind an idea especially for student athletes i think that that really pushes the narrative like when california made the rule that student athletes could get paid it really just pushed all the other universities and eventually just pushed the ncaa into finally signing it in so i think you know nothing's impossible um and it just really depends on what the athletes want at the end of the day yeah it's it's been such a cool thing to see because to your point Mm -hmm. i've experienced it as well and i was not personally, just but by looking at other, you know, players uh, on all these types of sports and saying like, there's so much value that's being captured. Like, yes. shouldn't they be be the biggest like beneficiaries of all that value right. that's being created? So to me, this has been such a no brainer thing. And you sit there and wonder like, we're going to sit here and wonder back ten years from now, like, the, how could it have ever existed? Yeah, like, why do we do this different? You know, it's so interesting too because obviously the schools like they're selling tickets they're using um the images like even if they have their own youtube page or they have their own TikTok page or instagram page like you receive programmatic revenue for like every time the video is watched and such so they're receiving money regardless and really like the athletes what they're receiving money on is what they're like posting so if let's say um like captain crunch comes in and wants a post from one athlete that you know eats Captain Crutch every morning, like they're going to get paid some money for that. And I think that that doesn't really interfere with, you know, whatever apparel deal the school is on. So I think it's different and it's, you know, monetizing social media. And this whole conversation came up just from the change in marketing. Social media itself is a 16, like something billion dollar industry. And like, there's so much opportunity for creators. I think that's something that was just going to happen regardless. Yeah, no, and and it's a no brainer too. Like the, the players are the ones creating all the value. They're the yeah. ones that fill the stands. You go, you, you know, you go and you, it's just like in the pros. You go and you mm-hmm. watch those individuals. Those individuals are compensated because ultimately the teams are making hopefully more money because yeah. now people exactly. are coming to the stands. So it, right. it, it's, yeah, I, I was kind of surprised to hear how many people were initially against the idea. Cause I'm thinking, yeah, I mean, they still are too. Right. Like they Speaking think like it ruins amateurism. Um, and like, I definitely understand the argument because yeah, they are being paid. Um, and they are being paid for the fact that they are an athlete, but they're also not allowed to say like, I am an athlete of like LSU and like, I play this sport, that sport. They can't technically say that. So even though, you know, athletics has gotten them that platform, they're kind of monetizing on like, who they visually are um, and like the fact that they are just an athlete in general. So it's really interesting. I mean, even in a company point, you know, like we use social media to get our message out. Like we're on Instagram live right now. I think that this change and this level of importance that we put on social media is even really interesting too. Like it allows us to connect with all the people, the 30 plus people that are on the stream right now. And even like the podcast, even, um, you know, our Twitter, it just gives you another ability to reach more people. 100%. Couldn't agree more. (laughs) It's interesting too. I mean, kind of 
along with like hurdles that we're talking about uh, with NIL and things, what was like a hurdle for sports trade and even just for you at? I think the biggest hurdle, like just thinking about this, mm -hmm. I think one of the biggest ones is that sports betting became like essentially legal in May of 2018. So mm -hmm. almost about four years ago to the date. And obviously when you're a startup, you're raising money and you're trying to build a team and you're, you know, you're trying to do all these things. And I think the excitement around sports betting was so high and mysterious. Yeah. It was really hard to pitch the differentiators of sport trade mm -hmm. because the sport trade pitch really is, and the first few words of the first, you know, slide is like, forget everything you know about sports betting. Yeah. It's literally. really hard to do when someone's, everyone's already excited, so much excited about sports mm -hmm. betting. And I think we spun our wheels a lot. We went to the Comcast, Techstars, mm -hmm. NBCU platform um, accelerator, which was great. Yeah. And we had a really tough time raising money because all of the VCs were like, oh, sports betting is so new. Like, Alex, you just gave me a crash course on sports betting. How could I lead this round? You know, you're the expert type thing. Yeah. And I think ultimately it just came about like meeting the right people. Right. Uh, and though that happened in a lot of interesting ways. It was some cold inbound and outbound LinkedIn yes. messages. It was meeting, I'll give someone a shout out, Avi is our head of product, meeting him in uh, late 2019. And the second he heard the idea, he goes, absolutely, here's how we're going to build it. And, you know, yeah. We to the coffee shop. And, you know, we joke all the time, we want to go back to that coffee shop. And <laughs> just think, oh man, imagine if we just knew then, knew now, knew that yes. we now type thing. So I think that was the biggest hurdle. But that got a lot easier when we ultimately found the right investors. Right. And then building the team, like one of the coolest things about Sport Trade is that everyone's so excited. Mm -hmm. So when someone comes in for the first day, they probably have seen a lot of our marketing materials. They get super mm -hmm. excited. Um, they, you know, there's like virality kind of network effect component yes. of excitement and passion. And everyone comes super excited about what we're doing. And I think mm -hmm. a huge shout out to the marketing team for like being able to create that platform. And we meet people all the time. We met a yeah. recruiter this week and they're like, by the way, like your marketing materials are awesome. Like I did my background on you. Like this would be the easiest job ever for me if you like added me as a recruiter, you know? And, yeah. and like, that's really, really cool. So that's mm -hmm. been the biggest hurdle I think, but you know, the opposite is true is once you do create that excitement, it, it kind of does carry you forward in the same way yeah. you struggled with it initially. Yeah, no, I agree. I think, you know, when you're a like, quote unquote, like game changer in the industry, like even on the creator side, you know, a lot of brands, they pay off the CPM. So they pay like, you know, pretty low values for each creator's piece of content. And like, we're really coming in and our whole goal is democratizing the industry. So we're trying to get the payment raised like at the $30 CPM. So really getting like the true value for the content and like the content creators time that it takes to make all of this. Um, so like, even in that sense, like working with brands, you know, it's great. And there's a lot of great brands out there, but a lot of times they think they understand like what influencer marketing is, but we're coming at it from a different angle that like, we're here to protect the creators. We're here to get them paid the correct amount. So it's hard finding those brands that like really resonate with you and are willing to put that money forward, but also stay on track with what you think. So I agree. Um, I think it's, it's all about like who you work with, who you meet people in your own, um, like area that really understand like what you're going for and like really believe in the end. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. a, that's a great idea. Yeah. 100%. And I think, I think in the last couple minutes, um, we definitely started to answer questions or if anyone had any comments, um, and they wanted to talk about like entrepreneurship, being a startup founder, if you guys have any ideas right now, or even if you want to talk a little bit about sports, um, sports betting and things of that type. As, as people, uh, sign up to ask any questions. I think the one thing I'd add, like the one thing I've really learned and gotten mm -hmm. so comfortable with is the, how many times you fail during the day as oh, an entrepreneur, yeah. or even someone that works at a startup company, like the concept of failure. And I don't mean like terminal failure. I mean, like calibrating of like figuring out how to do this is, is just table stakes. And the reason it is, is because you're building something new. So there is no playbook. If there was right. a playbook, you wouldn't be at the company and the company wouldn't be exist. Mm -hmm. So I think that there, you know, you have to get comfortable with the concept of failing and iterating mm -hmm. and the people that I have the good fortune of like interviewing at this point, mm -hmm. that's what I ask them. Like, are you willing to roll up your sleeves? Are you willing to fail? Cause you know, this is a team of people yeah. that are lift you up and we all fail together and we, mm -hmm. you know, kind of overcome those like extremely rewarding challenges. So that's been interesting to me. And like, I don't know at this point if I could ever go back to like a, 
you know, a non-entrepreneurial. Yeah, non I had that conversation too. I was like, could I do, and like, we're young too. So it's like a weird like thing to say like, oh, like I don't think I could ever go back to nine to five, but like you have your whole life ahead of you. But, you know, working in the space and like having that freedom to be able to pursue like what you believe in, be able to do all of those things. I think it's, uh, it's an interesting topic to not really be interested in going back to a nine to five. Mm -hmm. Looks like there was one question. How does one gain a marketing team? Yeah, I get, I think, I feel like that's a little bit targeted on the creator side. Um, <laughs> so as far as marketing services go, you know, it can range from anything from having a management team that represents you as an influencer. Um, if you're a business, you can have a marketing team internally, or you can hire a marketing consultant. Um, that can go anything from, you know, using influencers to push out your message, push out your product. It can go all the way to using like ads, um, like Facebook ads and things like that. So really determining, you know, what you want to use the marketing efforts for, who they're targeted at, what efforts you want to use. And then from there, you can figure out, you know, who's the best fit. Is it an influencer management company? Is it an ad marketing service? Um, and I think that's the best way to go about it. I don't see any other questions, um, but I guess to that point too, I think the nine to five conversation is so interesting, especially because people are like work from home now, like everyone pretty much has some level of entrepreneurship lifestyle to them. They're, you know, waking up in the morning, kind of setting their own schedule. Um, you know, some people like pants down, they're definitely wearing pajama pants, um, <laughs> but they have to have like their own Zoom set up and create their own schedule. So I think you know, post, uh, post COVID slash, you know, in this time period, it's interesting that people had this like entrepreneurship component to their nine to five jobs too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The structure's completely gone away. I was, yeah. Like, I think that that's really interesting too. Like the concept of like thinking back, like how much time do people waste driving an hour and a half? Oh yeah. Work? Yeah. And how much time do you actually get back? It's unbelievable. And even if you're not working a whole three hour Delta, even if yeah. you're walking your dogs, you're meditating, or you're doing yoga, or you're working out, or you're watching TV, mm -hmm. like, wow, that's like 8%, like one out of, what is that, 12% of your life back if it's three yeah. hours a day. It's exactly. Crazy. Yeah, and I mean, I drove like an hour and a half in terrible Whitestone Bridge traffic to the Mets, and like, I remember trying to fill the time with like phone calls or like networking meetings and things, but like you're driving, there's only so much you can do, and I think- right. Yeah, like just being able to like get up and like walk over to your office um, and then even have time to like make meals during the day. People are saving money. It's so crazy how different it just is. Uh, it's like work from home lifestyle and how this is really the norm and companies aren't going back to the office and things like that. I think it's really interesting. Super interesting. Well, that's some sort of multitasking, uh, networking and driving in New York traffic. That is, uh, that maybe that's a sport. Add that, add that yeah. to your list of yeah, really. Actually, someone had a really good question. Um, he said, are you planning to, or she said, are you planning to always be a Philly based? Or are you looking at headquarters in other cities? Or are you planning on going to a more like remote based long term? I'd say, you know, we are, thanks Mimi for your question. Uh, we're pretty remote at the moment. I think we have maybe 60, 70% of our company in the Philadelphia area. We just hired someone from Atlanta yesterday, for example. We have another person in Atlanta. We have people in Chicago. We have people in the West Coast, uh, Colorado, Arizona, mm -hmm. Florida. Um, I think ultimately it would be really cool to open up an office, you know, further west as yes. we think about like the operational nature of sport trade, like opening mm -hmm. exchange, shutting the exchange down. I think Denver is a pretty cool spot. Mm -hmm. So I think ultimately we could do something like that, but I don't think it will ever be like this is HQ2 and everyone's expecting yeah. a report because it's just like kind of not our culture. Yeah. No. That makes sense. No, that was a good question. I mean, in this last like minute or so, if anyone else has any other questions, whether they're, you know, entrepreneurship, um, portrait related, whatever it might be, we'll give you another second to just kind of pop those questions in. I've been trying to like people's comments. Um, a lot of people have been sending like hearts and like little emojis. Um, so, oh, someone said definitely go to the Denver office. <laughs> nice. Mm. I wonder if it's a sport trade employee that maybe lives out in Denver. Could it be? Could it be Derek? No, I'm secretly just like, trying to plug in Denver. <laughs> Denver's a really cool spot. Like the first time I went yeah. to Denver, I was it was February. I'm like, oh, I'm gonna bring my winter jacket. It was 65 degrees. Uh -huh. What? Uh, my mind yeah. is still, my mind still is blown. And then like it, obviously you drive up the hill. 
Yeah. And it's winter, full on winter in Breckenridge or wherever. But mm -hmm. um, it's so weird. Like I, uh, I grew up in upstate New York, like Syracuse, and then I did pretty much my whole career and sports career in the Northeast. Um, so this was my first winter. Previously, I was in Dallas. Now I'm in LA. That I completely skipped winter, and it was so weird seeing, seeing like cars um, going through like lights on the lake where they do like Christmas lights by the water. And it's like people are in t-shirts and shorts like walking it and it's christmas and like it was just so weird like it was not a white christmas it was so odd and like it's just normal for them like this is what they do every year yeah oh that's interesting my my, my mom's side of the family is from syracuse so like my earliest okay. college football memories are going to the carrier dome yep um mm -hmm. and and uh and watching the basketball games and the football games. Mm -hmm. my mom Syracuse orange my grandfather Syracuse orange and I have a lot of friends that are that are that are oranges I suppose yeah yeah it was a fun it was a fun time to grow up in you know it's uh I almost went to Syracuse too but it's such a sports community that like that's really like how my uh background started it was just growing up with you know Syracuse basketball Bayheim, like that being like a huge focus um and even like going back in a little bit to like Ernie Davis Jim Brown with the football so it was definitely a uh, spurred my like sport. <laughs> yeah, that was the first national championship I remember, 2003. Okay. Syracuse yeah. beat Kansas, and I think Kansas had like Kirk Heinrich back then. Mm -hmm. and Syracuse had uh, Carmelo Anthony. Yep. And yep. they had one other player, oh Jerry McNamara. Yep. yep. Who was like this five foot eight white guy that could shoot from like half court basically. Yeah. So it was that was like that was the dream team. It was so cool. Yeah. And those old. Good times. It's, uh, it's definitely changed a lot since I've been there, but so do all cities. <laughs> yeah. I think I think that was the last question and comment we had. I know we're a little bit over, um, besides Dan commenting that he's so old. <laughs> Dan, <laughs> Dan has the best TikToks on our page, like by far. <laughs> hey, Greg's are really good too. I love the, I love the SpongeBob that too. references. <laughs> are, I mean, every time I see him in the office, I'm like, "Can you, can you do it again? Can you?" And you're, and you're like, "He's like, you realize it's not my voice, right?" I'm like, "Yeah, yeah but I feel like you." Like, yeah, but like, I really just want to hear you do it. Even like watching people do TikToks, like watching them film it, um, especially if it's like not their voice and they're just voicing it, it's really funny to watch. Yeah, hilarious, it's hilarious. But yeah, thank you so much um, for popping on, having me on the stream too. And uh, I think we can download this after if people want to watch it. Um, and then if you guys have any more questions, just Come on, enemy the pictures, send a message to the actual Instagram account. Um, we're happy to get back. Awesome. Thanks so much, Rachel, and I hope everyone has a great weekend.